Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. We've got a friend of mine on here that we have tried to do this for several years, Corey Zillig. Corey is a uh, frogman by trade and now an engineer and creator of some super cool targets. We did a video on them uh, last year at the range day for military and law enforcement out at SHOT Show. That's up on our YouTube channel. We're going to talk about Corey's background. We're going to talk about what made him who he is today. We're going to talk about his target system and why he brought it to market and where you can see one and uh, all that good stuff. And I also got to remind you that this podcast is being brought to you by Gunfighter Gun Oil. And today we actually have a gunfighter on here, so that's cool. You can get Gunfighter Gun Oil at carrytrainer.com exclusively. Hey, Corey. Sorry for hey, that Mick, long intro. Oh, no, no, it's good. Uh, you know, there's, you probably took a few liberties when you said engineer. Uh, <laughs> not really, but... Yeah, you, um, sort, you sorted it out, though. You engineered I, what was in your head onto, like or into the real world. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you don't have like a degree that says like licensed engineer. No, no, that part I do not. But figuring out uh, basically kind of what, what everybody used to do in our trade, you know, just figure stuff out. That's what I'm doing and learning a shit ton along the way. As I can cuss mm -hmm. on this thing, can I? Yeah, you All can right. say whatever the you want. Um, All right, cool, cool. I don't have any plaque on my wall that says licensed exotic dance instructor, but I still do it. So sometimes I don't know if you have to have like a piece of paper to do the deed. No, no. Yeah. So I met you a few years back um, out at a, a like a course curriculum development that, that we were both brought on to, to um, add something to. And, uh, I was attracted to you, not in like a uh, sexual manner, but yeah, we had nice conversations and um, I noticed right away that you were extremely opinionated. So just for the listener, this was a room of like, um, what do you think? Maybe 20 guys were out there? Uh, yeah, there was about 20. Yeah. Most of them came from special operations backgrounds or um, tactical law enforcement. And then there was me, like the the weird little fat, ugly kid sitting there, which I really don't feel that way about myself. But, you know, you're listening to this, all these guys going back and forth like opinions, and then you'd be like, wait a second, you're all stupid, and here's why. That's how I, I think remember. you're, par That's exactly I, I how think I you're paraphrasing. That's think how you're it paraphrasing. sounded to me. <laughs> That's how it sounded to me. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. We'll continue. <laughs> so so well, I'm painting a picture here for the viewer listener. So you you have some very deep opinions on uh, training in the context of combatives between humans. Like, wh where does that come from? Uh, how did you develop those deep opinions and feelings? What's your background? Talk about it a little bit. Uh, it just came from my time in the military, you know. So I uh, did 20 years in the SEAL teams and uh, spent the bulk of my career at uh, development group and deployed a lot. and got to do some uh, cool stuff. And during that time, uh, I, yes, I did develop some opinions and just because of my nature, they are kind of strong opinions, but I've also done a lot of training and I've seen what works and I've seen what doesn't. Um, and a lot of that stuff where I was like kind of opinionated during that time you're, you're talking about was I was really brand new out of the military at the time. Like I had mm -hmm. just retired maybe a few months and, um, I had fallen into the trap of just assuming that people kind of know what I know. And that's like, you know, sometimes I was just like, Hey, well, you know, like this is not a big deal. I'm not worried about this. I'm like, let's just, that that's basic. That's elementary. And you, and some of you guys that had a lot more experience, well, a ton more experience training civilians than I did had said, no, 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 no. That's not, that's not basic uh, elementary stuff. That's actually more advanced things than you were thinking. But just because of my background and handling a gun for 20 years as my primary duty, um, I, I, guess, I guess I did take some things for granted. But to rewind what back you were saying, uh, yeah, I, I had some strong opinions about training and I do feel that, uh, that you know, there are uh, some good ways, some bad ways, but you know, 
one way is not the only way to learn. That's one thing sure. I have come to learn. Sure. So. Yeah, you and you. Not only did you spend a lot of time using guns all those years, but you spent time using guns with some of the best people in the business doing it. So it wasn't like like regular Navy or Army where you're with maybe some dudes that only go to boot camp. Like I've got lots of friends that serve, but they say the only time I ever touched a gun is when I went to basic training. And then after that, my job didn't require it. But then people say, oh, he was in the military or she was in the military. He or she must know. But your job was guns. Yeah. You know, being in special operations, it's it's like that gun is an extension of your of your body. I mean, I mean, I guess it, it'd be the same thing if you're an 11 Bravo in, in the army. You know, like that. Your primary duty is using that weapon in combat, and you've got to be very comfortable with it. You've got to be very proficient with it. And uh, you know, we're we're able to have a lot of money for uh, our training budget, which offered me the uh, the privilege of go- basically training all the time and going to a lot of different places to train and uh, learning from a lot of different people. So no, yeah, I, I, uh, developed a lot of, uh, I guess like bringing it back opinions. <laughs> what was the bulk of your career spent doing? I don't mean like what missions were you sent on? I mean, what was your job? Like, so you, 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 I know at one point were in charge of training, right. For your, your yeah. group of dudes. Yeah. So, um, I guess I didn't really have a, a a specialty as much as some of the other guys have. Um, I Does was that mean that you were good at everything, or that you just <laughs> well, I, I get, that depends who you talk to. Yeah. But um, no, the 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 thing is, I went through like I went through sniper school, but I'm like what I like to call a sniper and qual only because I never really served that in that capacity while I was. Although I have the like. Like we were talking about the certifications. Although I have the certification, I really don't have the the job experience serving yeah. that capacity. Uh, I was a breacher along for for quite a bit, you know, serving as like you know, just a tactical breacher and then a heavy breacher. Within, so for folks uh, listening, just a little bit, like what? So if somebody's got that job title, what like what's the the day to day operational uh, tasks look like? I don't mean like down to the nuts and bolts, but like you're the guy in charge of making the doors open up. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you know, you're uh, you're usually the guy that goes up with a with a team to the target and, and either uh, finds a way in or 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 basically just goes to the uh, primary entry point and deems whether it's open or or needs being opened. And so then you sort out how to get it open. Yeah, and then there's also there's other things when it comes to breaching as far as like a larger kind of like larger use of explosives. Uh, but well, I really want to get into that. No, no, no. That's not what I meant. But just so the listener can understand, like that that job means you're the guy that figures out how to get the rest of the dudes where Correct. it is you need to go. Correct. I just carry a lot of bombs on me and then place them on doors and blew a bunch of crap up to make it very simple. Gotcha. And then, so that was a big chunk of your experience. And then what else? Um, so like you were saying, I did run, uh, I ran part of our uh, selection and training, right? So usually the way our selection worked or our selection and training was, we call it s and selection training, but really it is a selection course the whole way through. Um, it began with CQB and then goes to Air Ops and Spec Ops has all these different things. And not it, no one really had like a specialty. Everyone who was an instructor in that capacity taught everything but you were kind of assigned trips. And one of the trips that I was assigned was our CQB. And so that's where I kind of got uh, a lot of uh, experience, not only uh, doing CQB, but teaching CQB. And that's where, you know, I I do have a a pretty good background in that. So Mm -hmm. taught that for a while and, and uh, went to the squadrons after that, and then continued to do it and uh, teach it in the capacity of a team leader. then I noticed talking with you uh, when we first met, my takeaway was I understood why you were so opinionated about stuff because just for the listener and viewer, the context of what we were doing was working on a, a nationwide training program for armed citizens. And uh, it seemed like in many ways, a lot of the focus for some people at a beginner level was strictly marksmanship, but your take and I agreed with it, kept coming back to, well, wait a second, these people got to be able to fight with these guns because that is the purpose of having it. My takeaway, not your words. And I'm a, I assumed at the time, maybe correct, maybe incorrect, but that a lot of that came from the CQB stuff. 
Yeah, it, it did. And I think a lot of, I, I think we got into some discussions about, uh, what do they call it? Shooting from retention, right? So I think a lot of this derived from the shooting from retention stuff. And uh, they wanted to teach that on the range, but not really get into the combative sport part of it. And, uh, you know, that's kind of like, well, you know, once you're shooting from retention, somebody's pretty much inside your range. And that's when I think we were discussing like, hey, you are fighting with this gun. Um, and that's for me, like, hey, yes, marksmanship's a big thing, but combat marksmanship is, it's a lot about speed. And it's a lot about, I mean, of course, it's about accuracy, but it's a lot about speed and it's a lot about movement, right? And, uh, you know, yeah, that dovetails into CQB, but it also dovetails into fighting. If you're doing something close up, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you're going to get, uh, things are going to get messy. Go on. <laughs> 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 well i think the point so you just your ending point there that sentence i think uh, illustrates what what the crux was guys were trying to in all of these men were all awesome and all had a lot of great experience more more so than most but it, it was like let's teach a mechanical skill set without the the theory and and other hard skills like like you said, if I'm having to draw a pistol and shoot here off my belt, there's some really big problem here. Like I'm in a hallway or elevator and there's some dude yeah. choking me to death. Like, so, yeah, I guess instead of dancing around the subject, I guess my big thing was, is you can't really teach, you know, shooting from retention. If you start, if you don't teach like some basic principles of combatives, like something very simple, and I know you do a little jujitsu, but something as simple as position before submission, mm -hmm. right? Being in a position to do something before you execute the actual move right so it's the same thing as okay do you want to draw your gun when you don't have the space to do it maybe you want to just establish that master grip and then get that other hand out create that space and then draw your gun um and it's hard to do this like hey you know like they were teaching a lot of this like and i and i do see there's a lot of people out there that do teach it like this is kind of absorbing it's almost like you're like absorbing for a blow like you're absorbing mm -hmm. for shock and then you're pulling out your gun and you're canting it and you're firing from like some sort of like almost retracted compressed position um and in my i guess in my uh, uh opinions that's just not really the mindset you want to go with because you're you're already at a disadvantage because if you're just if you're waiting to absorb that blow you're already somebody's momentum is already carrying you in a direction that you don't want to go mm -hmm. right which is either backwards or on your ass on the floor or, or any other of uh um well basically positions that aren't in your favor it's a little so bit me of it's a, all about car, car, the beat, car before the horse kind of a thing yeah and you know it's it's not like you have to get into a whole it, you don't have to get into a whole integrative combatives course to do it you just kind of have to teach some basic principles and mm -hmm. then um and then when guys go on the range they can do a lot of these like compressed positions just to feel like what it feels like when you're indexing from like your rib cage and canted and like, Hey, this is what it yeah. feels like when you're, when you are shooting without, you know, looking down your sights um, and right next to your body. Um, and then also like basically finding that natural aim point. But you know, to be quite honest, a lot of that stuff just goes right out the window when you're like, when you're in a tussle, like when you're in a dust up, it's like you're, you're trying to upset his balance. He's trying to upset your balance all the while that you're trying to deploy weapons, both of you. So it can get a little bit, it's a little bit oversimplified when you say, all right, fist to the temple, brace for impact, draw gun, you know, index, mm -hmm. and then fire a few times. And you're like, well, that's a great drill to do on the range just to feel that, you know, but when you get to that position, it could be, it could be a, uh, uh, you could be in like a, a pretty good dust up. Our friends I mention often on this podcast from ShivWorks, Paul Sharp being one of them, is uh, spent his life explaining to people and vetting it through training that we can't train without some type of force coming back against us. Like, because you're training for perfect scenarios. And I don't know how many people I ask if they've got a drone for their their pistol like you know just a dummy so they can train these kinds of things like all right i'm gonna try to stop you from drawing it and you try to draw it and uh, shit this is really hard to do it's not this doesn't always work because i bear hugged you and slammed you into the ground 
And, you know, I think personally, like in order to really understand combatives and integrated combatives, you've got to get, you've got to do a little bit of like sport fighting. You know, like when I mean Mm -hmm. sport fighting, I mean like boxing, wrestling, MMA, that type of stuff, just to really understand how you're moving, you know, because when you're talking about like, hey, getting taken up, a lot of it has to do with cutting angles. You're creating space. You want to cut an angle. Um, It's not so much as linear or just like pushing into something and driving it. Yeah. as it is like deflecting that energy, turning, cutting an angle, getting your pistol out. Cause you may never, the goal should be never shoot from retention. That should be the goal to never shoot from retention, get that dude out of the way, create the space and then get your sights online. So you can uh, basically end it with one clean shot. Mm-hmm. Although it can happen. And oh, it can happen. And that's what I'm and that's, for, right? There you go. Exactly. You did a lot of boxing. You said you, you guys, uh, uh, you and some of your pals, like to box, right? Can you tell me that? Yeah, I wouldn't say I'm like a, a boxer or I'm, I'm like a, any, any type of level of martial artist, but I do like to train and I do like to go out there and train with my buddies and just to keep, just to keep uh, your skills up and just number one, being comfortable in a fight, you know, like being comfortable with somebody punching you in the face. You know, it's mm-hmm. obviously it's a lot different when it goes from when you're taking the gloves off to when you go bare knuckle or anything like a street fight to the ring. I, obviously there's... It's way different, but just being comfortable in that, you know, I'm that, that fighting mentality. It's, it's definitely something that I, yeah, I like to do and I still continue to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you, you spent all this time developing all these skills. And when I first found out about, we'll switch gears a little bit, your targets here. I was like, why'd you make these? And I, if I remember correctly, the thought process was you wanted to make a mobile target system that you felt created some really great training that you could pack into like a Connex or a pickup truck and take wherever your unit went or units, right? Yeah, it all kind of derived from like requirement training requirements that I felt that that I had or I needed when I was active duty, right? We, you know, our our success and failure was revolved around the primary, uh, the, the assaulter and his primary weapon system. You okay. know, like you, it didn't, didn't matter how you got there. didn't matter like anything else. Like if you screwed up with that weapon, uh, that could mean success or failure. So really we trained very hard with it. And we had a lot of, like I said, where I was really privileged to have all that, all those training sites and uh, different instructors. But well, some of the, my favorite places to go were are, were Shaw's, so we're mid south, right? And then uh, also we had a Rogers range at our command, and that was a great range. I love that range. The, the problem with that, that I felt was is that you had to go there in order to train, right? Like you had to go to that range. And so I mean, I trained, uh, I deployed, I went on training trips, I went all these different places. And when you left to go to those places, yeah, you might have a range to shoot, but it wasn't at the level of like a Rogers range or a mid South. Mm -hmm. So really I wanted to build a system to where I could go and wherever I went, I deployed or I was on a training trip. As long as I had a suitable place to shoot, I could have that style, that, that style of like really challenging, fast paced, uh, dynamic shooting. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and so that's why we built, uh, the mitts or, the mobile interactive target system. So it's so basically the, a, a, go ahead. Well, I was going to say for the listeners, viewers, what, what, uh, Corey's talking about Rogers shooting school, the original school. I know that there's some, um, replica ranges set up. It is a course of fire with pneumatically controlled steel targets. And you could show up there 10 years ago or show up there today in, and see the same course. And it's a, a uh, Bill Rogers that, that created the school and runs it, uh, created, it's, it's meant for learning to shoot fast, accurately, uh, really hard par times, and uh, people from all walks of life go there. Our friend uh, uh, Gabe White is, I think, the only person ever to shoot it clean from concealment, which is pretty cool. He shot the, shot the course clean from concealment with a stock block, which is pretty sweet. And then... Um, Mid South Shaw, uh, John, right? John Shaw. He, yep, John Shaw. John created a school that has become very synonymous with special operations units going to learn how to run their pistols fast and hard. I don't think anybody um, from the public is even accepted into that program anymore because he's been so busy during the global war on terror training up teams. 
but just so you understand what what he's talking about. So these are like high speed pistol shooting courses that uh, you really run your guns hard. Yeah. So oh, yeah. Now to mitts. Yeah. So basically, one the the mitts is their their targets. They're all independent of each other, but they all communicate on the same mesh. So you know how when you go to to like a Rogers range. It's a very linear range. I mean, yeah, you have different distances on like engagement distances. I think like seven to about twenty-five yards. Um, but all the the engagements are pretty linear. So you're, you're as far as your target transitions, you're doing really narrow transitions. What I kind of liked is when we were able to go to places that had targets that were farther spread out. Is you were able to work those wide transitions mm -hmm. uh, with your feet in with your feet in place, using your upper body as a tank to moving and engaging those targets, but also like moving and, and running from side to side um, and engaging it that way. So that's why I also not, I didn't want to just to have a range I could take and go different places, but I want to have a range that really had limitless configurations as far as like how you wanted to set up your range. Like as long as the targets can talk to each other and see each other, like as long as they're within a hundred yards of each other, you can set up whatever you want to. Um, and then, and then with time as your uh, time as your other, factor then you can like have the targets go up and go down for however long you want and Good really have in. unlimited in real, fire. really quick let me jump in just so yeah. folks understand so what this system is you created really robust steel targets that are portable they pack into a uh, pelican type case uh, uh, and are battery operated remote controlled they speak to each other and then collectively speak to a controller which is like an ipad or a computer right and Correct. the targets, like that's one of them in the back. What is that, like a 10-inch plate, 8-inch plate? No, this is a uh, an 8-inch by 8-inch okay. uh, square. So it's kind okay. of like, you know, we kind of base it on like a lethality zone, you know, something mm -hmm. that the military would consider a lethality zone. Or and like you've a You've got different shot. shaped plates. I do. I got, the, I, you know, this is just a square. It's kind of like the standard uh, target. But then there's a circle. I also have a little... Uh, like a little popper, little pepper popper, mm -hmm. which can really induce some frustration fire. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the base um, itself, yeah. the the mechanism is like what, 24 inches tall maybe? Yeah. yeah. About and maybe 12 inches, 14 inches wide? Probably not even that. Probably about like 9 or 10. It's all like armored 10, up with AR plate. And then in the yep. back is, is motors and gears and all that good stuff. And what's cool is the target is presented vertically and it pops up, right? On yeah. a gear system, when, when it's hit, it falls straight back, and then the motion of it being reset happens down below the target. That's exactly correct. And what's cool about it is, like, you could set these up like you were starting to say. I just wanted to jump in so people understood what we were talking about. You could it, – it, sky's the limit. You could make – you could take 10 of these, line them up in a row like a uh, uh, plate rack. You could place them all over a open field. You could – Move them wherever because they're just portable and they're radio controlled. And you can truck uh, when the targets appear, how long they appear for. So a target could appear and disappear before somebody even sees and shoots it. Yeah, uh, exactly. Exactly. And all so of it's we, recorded. And all of it's recorded. So really, we got kind of three different modes of operation. We got uh, like a regular manual mode, which you can manually set the targets. Hey, I want to go one up, one down, two up, two down, uh, uh, all up, all down. Or you can set them on a recycle mode where they go up and every time you hit them, they go down and come right back up. Right. So that's like a manual mode. And then the other modes are uh, just regular pre-programmed drills. So drills, they can be either self-paced or what I like a self-paced drill would basically mean like, oh, let's say you have six targets, three come up, you shoot those three down and then three more come up. You shoot those three down and then maybe two come up. So those self-paced drills are, de are, are dependent on you shooting the targets to get to the next stage of the drill, right? And so and more of a self All of those times are recorded. So I could go shoot that on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, try it again Thursday, Friday, and see if I've increased my or, – or sped up or decreased my time rather. Correct. And yeah. then the other one is like the timed way. It was like a pressurized way where now – you know, now you have six targets, three come up for 2.5 seconds and then drop down. And then the other three come up for 2.5 seconds ago. They're like, you know, you, you know what I mean? So now you can mm -hmm. have, now you can pressurize yourself with a little bit of stress on the time side. 
And then the other mode of operation is the standards, right? So what I, the standards are is you, we just take a bunch of the drills and package them all together into a set of standards. And so that way, you know, we had, we had standards when I was uh, active duty, you know, and a lot of them were developed uh, over there at Mid-South. Uh, one of them was called operator standards. One of them was called squadron standards. Um, and it really was just a series of drills that you had to have, like you had to make the part times in order to pass. And so really that's what the standards do. Like you, you pick a standard and I usually, I just call them something easy, like pistol one, pistol two, rifle mm-hmm. one, rifle two. I call it assault. I call it assault one, which basically is just both weapon systems, your rifle and pistol. If you were, you know, if your, your job required it, or if that's what you were training, um, and then and it just you, packages. You those created drugs. these part times in your program based on your experience, right? Well, or right, the ones well, that you have that are pre-programmed. Well, yeah, exactly. And well, right now there's no part time that says you pass or fail. Right now, it, it you kind of set your own part time. It'll just okay. give you what your times are. Gotcha. That way, I'm not setting this either super easy or super hard part time for everyone to uh, to hit. And of course distance to targets and spacing and all that is a factor. So if people, what yeah. was cool about this, you could have four or five teams deployed all over the world. You're the team leader. You create a course of fire with these target systems and would spell out what the uh, range setup is. And somebody in Africa or Canada or Texas could all run the same course, provide just like a USPSA stage, but then all of the data is logged and tracked. That's right. right. That's right. So to get to the point of the data, I, I record the, the reaction times and the target transition times. And really, there's, there's other things I'm recording, but to me, those are the most important. And if you right? miss, of course, miss or hit. Miss or hit. And, and yeah. to me, I, I, like, I, I, I don't record split times because they don't mean as much to me as a target transition time. Like, I don't really care if you have I'm not, I'm not going to say I don't care, right? But I kind of don't care if you have like a 0.2 second or 0.1 second split right? Like where you can pull that trigger super fast. It was like, congratulations. But when that target came up and that target came up, how much time did it take you to successfully engage this one and then transition and successfully engage that one, right? Mm -hmm. To where there, you both have good hits. Um, So that's really, I record the reaction time which your time to first hit, but you may have multiple reaction times within a drill. Cause if you knock down all the targets and then they all come back up your time to first hit, you know, you've got another reaction time within Mm -hmm. that drill. Um, this can be shot with both rifle and pistol. That's correct. So all the steel on here that's facing the, the shooter is, is uh, 3 8 inch AR-500 steel. And this, uh, this, the, the ones on the side, the side panels are, are quarter inch, but the angles of deflection are so steep that as long as you're engaging within 25 degrees of center line of the target, if you hit that, it just skips right off. I've you, shot did that for, you did that for weight, really, right? Trying to keep yeah, the weight down. Yeah. These things are all steel. It's an all steel target, all steel construction. I wanted these things to to be built to last and uh, take the abuse that a uh, that a military unit would would uh, put it through. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's it's a heavy system, but it's built to last. What's so I one had to wait somewhere. one unit way? Can you pan your camera back a little bit and oh, show yeah, us yeah, what, yeah. what one of them looks like? And this one, I've never seen you had one painted up, so that's cool because if you had this out in the field somewhere. You don't want to be able to possibly, you possibly don't want the shooter to be able to identify where everything is. So you could be out and that sucker pops up and you're like, oh shit, there it is. Yeah. Um, so right now, most of them, they all come in black, right? And so that, like the ones you shot in Vegas, they were all mm-hmm. black. And, you know, when you're out there, you just, they stick out like freaking dog's balls, man. Like, there's just a bunch of black targets out there. Now that's not the target that you're shooting. You don't know when the, this, this paddle comes up, right. but at the same time, you kind of see where they are. It's right? like whack-a-mole. I don't know if the head's there yet, but I know there's a hole there and it's coming eventually. Yeah. 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 With this, with, with the camo pattern on here, you know, I can set these uh, a little further back. And uh, of course you don't, you can't really zone in on them until that head plate comes up. Can you shoot those with a shotgun or a slug? Have you tried that at all? Is it? Yeah, you can. It just you just want to be at a safe distance, you know. Safe I, distance but a slug's not too. It's not too abusive to it. The energy no. dumping it over. No. Okay. No, you can you can hit this thing with seven six two NATO. Okay. All right. As long as you're right. at a safe distance, all safe distances apply. Mm-hmm. 
And you're now fielding these in various places. Uh, you and I, when we're finished today, are going to talk about hooking up next week to do some filming with one at another friend's range. Uh, a normal package of these is six. Is it six you get them in? You can get them in packages of six, three, four, five, okay. uh, even up all the way to twelve. Um, so really, I, I six is really, really versatile. You can do a ton with six, right? Um, I, what I like to consider like the kind of the minimum is three. It's not that you couldn't use two or even one, but you're not really getting the full benefits of the system unless you have three. Um, so, I mean, you can with just one, but like I said, you're not getting the exact benefits of the system. It, uh, and some of the, the standards I, I have, some of the most basic standards I have, really just operate off of one target. So like I said, it's not that you can't just get one. It's just that if you really want to get the full uh, benefit of the system, three is about the minimum. What is um, all six of them? What do they weigh? So if you, or, or what do they weigh each and we can add it up? Right, so if you're like throwing this in a, in a Pelican case, right, to, to transport, the target with batteries about, 45 pounds and then the ballistic shield itself is about 80 right okay. and so but it's all like none of this is like you're not lifting this major like 80 pound thing all at once 125 um, pounds though yeah you can assemble it all yep about 125 pounds you can assemble it all with no tools uh from that pelican case um so it doesn't really need a whole lot of uh, uh you know the field assembly is like really easy mm -hmm. i used to set a lot of these I set up ranges by myself a bunch of times and just would pull a trailer and, and pull out the, the, the targets out of Pelican cases out into the field and setting them up by myself from all prepackaged and, you know, strapped down into a trailer would take me about, well, 45 minutes and then breakdown would take about 30. So, okay. but that's just one guy. Like sure. if you have two guys, you're basically, you're looking at like 15 minutes and 10 minutes. I'm asking because I'm wondering how much six of them is going to add to the weight of our travel trailer for. Oh yeah. I've, I've loaded them in the back. I've loaded six in the back of my uh, Tundra before and driven uh, about four hours and it was, that's a lie. You know, well, I've, I would I've got recommend a, a trailer, but uh, I've got a training trailer. It's already full of a couple thousand pounds of TA target steel. So um, I might have to upgrade to a bigger, a bigger trailer. I've got her pretty well jammed full now. And then I put my beer cooler in there and she's dragging. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> For you guys listening, I don't drink on the range when there's guns out. So don't freak out. I don't want to hear you. There is a lot of people that kind of, they get very, uh, what I say, like testy about certain stuff. Like, like if you were to say a joke, like, like Oh my God, Mickey's like, he's drinking on the range or, or, if you were to demonstrate some sort of thing on your Instagram or YouTube or whatever, like there are some people who are pretty opinionated and they're very testy about stuff. I so noticed. a friend of ours, Claude Werner, the tactical professor, Claude was a Green Beret. Claude is also, he, they call him a professor because he is one. He's uh, hyper intelligent. He's a data guy. And uh, a couple days ago, a picture went around the internet of a, uh, a woman at Walmart, she's got on like yoga pants. She's a bigger lady and she's got a pistol attached to the yoga pants, no belt. And uh, the pants are like pulling down. You see a triangle of bare skin like on her hip where the, and it's, it, it's like a, one of those Walmart pictures, right? Well, it, the only nice thing was, was it had a hood. It was a retention holster. So you're like, okay, you got like a halfway decent holster, like why no belt? But anyway, all these people like jumped on her, like Ugh, Walmart, and, oh, somebody needs to tell that bitch, you know, open carries for idiots. And it was just like, it blew the internet up for a day or two of people just wanting to attack her. And Claude posted a, a, a little kind of like synopsis on it on his private Facebook page, basically saying like, hey, maybe as a community, we could offer like help, like, Here's a good belt. Or or maybe we could say at least she has a gun and it's got a hood. And, you know, like it, it, it just like like that. And I thought my comment to it was it would be amazing if all the people that uh, commented spent their time trying to, like, teach their kids good, good behavior and teach their kids to vote for good constitutional uh, representatives. Like instead of sitting there wasting their fucking time 
arguing about what somebody else is doing. I've heard something before. I, I, I don't know where – was it – I think it was – uh, if you don't have something nice to say, <laughs> maybe you shouldn't say it at all. Like, I mean, there is that? some truth to, like, <laughs> I know somebody could look at that and say, well, somebody could just rip that off of her pants and it's a, it could be a danger to the public. Like, there is some truth to that. You see these stupid pictures where there's like a guy at Subway and he's got like two six shooters sho- just shoved in his back of his, you know, pants and, and it's open. Like, okay, you need to maintain security with your weapons i get that but i'm with you yeah so you know, people do yeah. jump on stuff they they do man and it's the, it is it's the, uh it's kind of funny actually the funny thing is is like the gun community that like professes to be like lovers of liberty like you know don't tell me what to do and from my cold dead hands we want to tell everybody what to do don't tell me what to Except I get to tell you what to do. That always is. Yeah. That always makes me chuckle. <laughs> you know what I mean? In, indeed. Oh yeah. So back to this target system for a minute. I don't want to like turn this all into a sales pitch. Uh, but while we're on the subject, how does somebody yeah. find it? Uh, they can go to zftechnical.com. That's uh, Zulu Foxtrot. The word technical.com. Or they can just email me at. Corey, that's C O R Y with a Z at zftechnical.com. Mm-hmm. So they can, uh, they can do either way. Like if they just, if they go to the website, you know, you get the contact us, you go there, bam, that, or yeah, we're on social media too. So if you go to uh, ZF Technical on Instagram or Facebook, uh, you can DM us and uh, we'll get the message. We'll get right back to you. I think if you punch into Instagram hashtag ZF Technical, the couple, I've done some videos where we tagged it or um, just search that that tag, uh, you'll see a bunch of the videos, clips that I put up. And then Drew's really good uh, about putting links in. So I'm sure if you're watching this on YouTube, Drew, here's a good spot to insert a link for the video that we did. Uh, Which, uh, I'm sorry to mean to cut you off. I'd like to say thank you again, because you know what? I mean, obviously, you know, uh, as an entrepreneur here, uh, just building something and trying to get a, a vision to fruition and then, and then, you know, bring it out to the, to the general public. Um, you helped me in that endeavor. And so I really appreciate it. Yeah. Man. Thank you. I'm happy. I'm happy to. And that's, that's a good thing to segue into. You've been working at this a while. And what I've appreciated is you keep perfecting it. And I've talked to you many times where you're like, oh, we're having issues with this or that. And I'm just not ready to pump it out there yet because I, I can't put my stamp on it. Um, you're years into it. Yeah, I've been I noticed there's a, like a couple different ways to do things. Right. And and, you know, number one, I'm I'm kind of a perfectionist. I'm a little OCD. Uh, and plus, I, I, I worked really hard for my reputation while I was uh, active duty for me to turn around and then go out on the outside and then just piss that all away. I really don't want to do that. And I've seen a lot of people, they, they dump a lot of money into marketing and they dump a lot of money into like getting the message out. Um, but the product's not finished. Like, mm-hmm. but that's, but it's, I'm not saying that's wrong. It's just one way to do it because they're creating exposure and building up and they're hoping that, you know, their development cycle will reach that, that peak exposure time. And, and then they're off to the races. Um, I really wanted to focus on the product development and make sure that the product was tight and everything was good uh, before we went and released it, especially to, uh, to the military and law enforcement. Uh, those guys, they, you know, the, expectation, the expectations that those guys live, on, live to is, uh, you know, there's not a lot of time for bullshit. So I didn't want to interject bullshit into their time with giving them something that just didn't quite work right. Or if I was tweaking something, and I was like, oh, hey, here you go. Um, so yeah, I, they might I not tried, give you another chance. And that's, that's true. I'm not saying that, you know, I won't have issues in the future. And when you're building a machine, like machines have problems. Like you know, they look at a car, look at a gun. I mean, they have issues. It's nothing, yeah. but it's nothing you can't fix along the way. I just wanted to make sure that it was as tight as I could get it to the point where I felt comfortable and I felt confident in it to get it in front of those people. And so, yeah, it, it has taken me a a little bit of time, but I'm glad that we did it this way, vice the other way. Um, mainly because it's kind of given us an opportunity to see, you know, where we want to go with it and how we want to really 
you know, build this thing. Yeah. It's cool. I can see, I can't speak for any of the military applications, but I could totally see uh, a private citizen buying one if they can afford it and having it in their barn, dragging it out. Uh, if you had an open field that you can safely shoot in, you could have an excellent uh, training system or a private range or a public range. You could set this up where it's the, the ZF technical range and somebody runs the, the, computer and you don't need a lot it's not like you got to have some operator you run it off your cell phone right you run it you run it off of a so with every system we provide a tablet that's loaded okay. with the application so you can have that tablet as like kiosks the, the range safety officer could hold it the instructor could hold it um they could run through the thing and so part of the things that it's when you're it's kind of interesting you're saying about the, the the private side is we do have some customers that are in the private, mainly some uh, some higher end hunting ranches that have, mm -hmm. that have got the system, but I'd really like to get these uh, into public ranges because I, like I said, I was privileged to shoot at those ranges, like a place like the Rogers range, mid South, and there's other ranges. I'm just using those two as an example. There's yeah. other, there's a lot of uh, very cool ranges out there, but uh, a lot of them are primarily for military and law enforcement. Um, the public at large really doesn't get to experience that type of shooting all that much. And with a system like this, you can not only, you know, let the public experience that type of shooting, but you can host events where now you've got competitions, you've yeah. got people shooting at each other, you've got leaderboards, you can boost, you know, social media and like all your exposure on that way with, you know, filming some of these things and saying, Hey, look, we've got the best shooters at our range and we can prove it because look at all these guys times from yeah. the last event that we had. You know, it just makes shooting more fun. You know, I, I, I like, you know, I think if people, I would like people to feel more comfortable shooting. I'd like to have people more comfortable with guns and, you know, buy more, you know, I, I'm, I believe in our second amendment. Right. So in order to do that and people want to train, you got to make it fun. A punching yeah. holes in paper is definitely where like the fundamentals of marksmanship live. I, I, there's no disagreeing with that. Um, but eventually it gets kind of boring. Right. And you want to have something like really fun and, and dynamic to do to add a little bit of flavor to it. And there's no reason movement can't be incorporated in all of this as well. So, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's really a it, it's really a uh, like you said, dynamic way to shoot. That's that's fun. People ask me about different gadgets all the time. And I, I might say, like, yeah, I don't know anybody that uses it. But if it makes you practice or it makes you go shoot or you find it fun. Uh, you know, why wouldn't you use it if you can afford it? The, you're talking about the, the private ranges. I wasn't trying to say there's not a fit for it, but I can just imagine um, any range that could, like even an indoor range, you get a, like a wheeled cart, like you see at a grocery store, put them all on it, wheel them out onto the range, set them up and away you go. And the small enough target zone, that's a one problem with, with big steel is you get, I, yay, I got the hit on a 24 inch by 30 inch silhouette. Not that that's a bad thing, but you get uh, accustomed to this huge thing, eight inch, like you said, that's uh, a pretty finite target zone. Eight, eight misses are easy. Yeah, you know, aim small, miss small. I mean, if you're, if you're training to, to always shoot the IPSC, silhouette and i mean like what i mean i mean just like a large size yeah then you're and if that's your zone then obviously you're not going to be as good as if you're like hey it's not just the a zone on the the body it's like the very center of that a zone is where my aiming point is and that's the same thing with this like we basically just kind of took the the overall target and and brought it down to that eight inch zone but in reality when people are training on this thing when i'm training on it i am aiming for like a specific spot on the uh on the target and it just kind of yeah you don't want to you don't want to always aim for this big thing and get a false sense of security on how good you are you want to make sure that you know really know how good you are let's talk a little bit about like what got you to the point you're at now i know we talked about your actual background but what makes a guy spend 20 years doing what you did uh, time away from family. And I don't want to go down like the rabbit hole of like, I just want to serve my country because I know that that's all true. But the wear and tear to the body, um, uh, pushing yourself constantly to stay at that level because if you couldn't perform, you couldn't stay there, right? That's very true. 
I want to add, add one more thing just to yeah. like to set the tone for what I'm asking. I watched this really cool documentary last night. I'll have to look up the title of it. It was about uh, motorcycle racers. And they had like uh, three or four guys that were retired, but they were all champion, like super bike racers, you know, 200 miles. And they did an uh, interview of um, the race at the Isle of Man, that crazy race, you know, where they're going 200 miles an hour through like city streets and stuff. And like, I think yeah. 250 racers have died over the course of that race. Every year, somebody dies. And then they're interviewing like some current guys and they're following their career. And like the one, uh, psychologist that they interviewed, she said, uh, what I found people that, that win or rise to the upper echelons of anything, the only thing I've ever found that's static between all of them is they want to win. It's not like, you know, there's like nothing else that they really just want to win. And then that like, it could be being the best doctor or seal or whatever. Talk about that. Uh, so Really, like when I when I first joined the the Navy, it wasn't. I had yes, I had aspirations of being a SEAL, but it would and it had nothing with the the patriotic side in the beginning. I mean, I I had kind of a bad year as a kid. I was like, a, uh, you know, kind of going on, uh, going down the the wrong path. Even though How old? I was uh, nineteen. Okay. So I mean, I was I was out of high school. I was working for my father, um, you know, and I had. Uh, I was kind of a punk kid, you know, I just really didn't have much drive or direction and I just didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And then, so like a bunch of like shitty things just happened to me within a very short period of time, one year. And I just had this, like this whim, like I'm just going to join the military. And then I, I, you know, I always, I grew up watching the same movies as everyone else did in my, from my era, you know, like first blood predator, commando and i thought that that shit was cool so i was like well i want to go special operations and so when i went to the the recruiter i was thinking army or whatever you know i saw heartbreak ridge maybe i should be a marine you know maybe like clint eastwood will teach me a boot camp um <laughs> but uh the navy guy had like the prime real estate in the uh in the recruiting booth so he got to see all the suckers walk through the door before they before they turned left and then turned right down the hallway right and so uh he was kind of you know, he's doing his job. Hey man, what are you here for? What do you, you know, I'm going to join the army. Oh, Hey man, what for? You don't, you want to join those guys. We, oh, I'm going to go special operations. Oh, we got those guys. We got seals. Okay, cool. Well, let me show you a video. I'm like, all right, cool. So I went in there and he showed me a video and that was kind of, that was that, right. So it was like the be someone special video. Um, dudes repelling and climbing out of rubber boats and stuff yeah, in the cold, yeah. dark water. Stuff that looked cool. You know, yeah. when you're like a 19-year-old, uh, I don't want to say kid, but when you're a, a young man, like a 19, you're like, yeah, this shit looks cool, man. I'm going to do that. Um, so, so you never even up, made it down the hallway? Never made it down the hallway. Right. I just said, all right, cool. You know, I'll do it. And, and I also had some, uh, some family ties with the Navy. I had an aunt and an uncle in the Navy and, uh, uh, my, uh, and a great uncle as well that was in the Navy. So although my father was in the army, it was, he actually was pretty pissed off when I told him that. I <laughs> was he pissed off cause you joined or was he pissed off cause you joined the Navy? I know he just kind of pissed off that he, he basically, his first words were like, you don't know what the hell you've done. You just pissed your life away. So was your dad, your dad was pissed at you for signing yeah. up for the Navy or for, uh, going to the military in general? No, my dad was just, he, he was in the army, uh, during his time. Right. And so okay. he went to Vietnam and he had his experience and it wasn't a good one. And, you know, according to my father being in the, uh, in the army in the sixties wasn't, it's like the late sixties was not a good experience whatsoever. Okay. And so his time, his opinion of what it was like being in the military was not what it was, what it was going to be like for me. And also, uh, you know, I didn't know what I was getting into either. Cause I joined pre nine 11. It was one of these things where I was like, all right, cool. This is, I'm just going to do this. And you know, yeah, you always think that you're maybe going to go to war. You're going to train for war. I mean, if you, if you go to special operations, you're, you know, you're not joining to go, all right, cool. I'm going to go and uh, like sit back, kick back and run a radio or do nothing. Right. You're going to go there. You're going to go there to fight. But really, uh, you know, when, uh, I had told him that he was pretty pissed off, but he had, he had obviously changed his tune when, uh, I made it through buds and did the whole nine yards. Um, but he didn't, 
I don't think he was a big believer, right? Um, he asked me one time, he said, what's your backup plan? And I told him, I said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through buds and be a SEAL. He said, well, what's your backup plan? I said, there is none. That's it. It's this or death, right? <laughs> and he's like, you're dumb. He's like, you're <laughs> <laughs> He's like, seriously, what's your backup plan? I was like, I'm serious. There is none. And uh, I don't know if that was like one of the mindset things that helped me push through or, or the he fact that. He was being that a I, dad though, thinking about like, what if you blow your knee out? What if you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, it's probably the same thing I would ask my son. I'm not going to be like, yeah, Mervin, you know, on, you know, come home with your shield or on it, you know, like. Uh, I, that's just not. Mer Mervin. Mervin. Yeah. Mervin. What kind of a name is Mervin? I have never heard Mervin. That is my grandfather's name. Uh, so that is Mervin's. So my son's great grandfather, my grandfather was named Mervin. And so uh, since my wife and I had an agreement, she was going to name the girls and I would name the boys. We just happened to have one girl and one boy. And so now you call him Merv? we got Merv. Merv. Yep. Merv okay, or so Mervin. Yeah. Is, is Merv like when we hear people name Merv, is it always short for Mervin? I don't know. I got to Google that. But I would later. say so. I got to Google that. Okay, so it's like sidetracking you. So you, you wouldn't say the same thing to Mervin, or you would? No, I, I would probably say the same thing. Like, hey, what's your bag? Well, well, what if this doesn't work out? And then if he said, hey, you know, this is it. There's no backup plan. The chips are in the center of the table. You know, I, because I've been there, I'd go, all right, check. All right. But it's when a hard the, hey, thing when, sometimes to remember. I have had to do it many times. My son and I are going through some father-son stuff lately, and I have to remember, like, what was, how did I think when I was 20? How did I view the world? How did I view myself in the world? And I can't, I can't automatically base my memories and recollection of that on him because he's not me, and we have had different life experiences and we're different personalities and stuff, but that that um, experience of tossing all the chips into the center of the table on something that you're gambling on is a lesson I think every young guy's got to learn. Oh, yeah. You always got and, – and that's the thing, too, is that if, if he didn't say that to me, then it'd almost be like, well, is your mind in the right place? Because if you're going to be a, a, like a professional soldier, you're going to go to special operations and, and make a career out of it, you, you have to. You have to be able to – like push it all in the center of the table and let it ride and just be like, I'm in this. And then there is, there's nothing else. Right. If you don't have that attitude or, or mindset, there will be times in your uh, career that the, you, that, that card will get pulled. And if you don't have that mindset, it will test you. Right? Yeah. It will definitely test you. So moving forward, you just decided this is my career and just kept grinding it out, kept that same, yeah, well, I had some setbacks, man. Like I, I, like I said, I was kind of a punk. So I, you know, I was, when I was a kid, I, I had done some stupid stuff. So I had some crap on my record. And then the, 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 the recruiter was like, I oh, yeah, don't worry about it, man. Don't worry. We'll, we'll handwrite these waivers. I was a sucker. I didn't even realize that he was just setting me up for failure. So when I got to the dive motivator, they're like, well, we don't want people like you. You're, you're a damn criminal. And so, um, I had to overcome that, but I like going to the, so it was just adverse. It's just a test of adversity. It really was testing my mindset of pushing it all in the center of the table. Cause I had to go to the fleet and I had to go there as an undesignated seaman in the Navy. And if you don't know what that is, it's the lowest job that you can possibly have in the Navy. Like you are cleaning shitters and swabbing the decks and sweeping and, you know, like swinging a chipping hammer, like chipping paint off of uh, well decks and stuff. It, it is it sucks. Right. So had to do that for a little while. And then went to the teams, uh, just guys, excuse me, went to buds, um, was very fortunate that I was able to make it through buds with no injuries and, uh, no rollbacks. So I made it all the way through in one shot. And then Were you an uh, athletic kid, like play sports or anything like that in high school. No, <laughs> no, no. A lot of that stuff. I, I kind of like had to learn when I got older, you know, like I was, like I said, I didn't, I didn't have a lot of drive. Did you when skateboard? I was, did you ride your bike? Did you do anything? Uh, like, yeah, I, I wasn't I would, a big sports yeah. guy, but I did a lot of athletically centric things, you know? Yeah. I wasn't like, I wasn't like some, uh, some like mongoloid or dolt that doesn't know how to move his body. Right. I, I, I mean, I knew I, I would, I, you know, rode a skateboard, I rode a bike, you know, I even did a little bit of stuff. I, I wrestled a little bit when I was in elementary school and then I boxed a little bit when I was in junior high and I played rugby when I was in high school, but nothing really took, you know, like I was, 
like I said, didn't I didn't get have passionate any, about it. Yeah. I had no real drive or commitment. It really wasn't until I, I joined the Navy. And then all of a sudden I was just like, all right, I quit. I was, I was uh, smoking a lot like cigarettes, quit that. I didn't know Drink. you were a smoker. Oh yeah. Yeah. I smoked for, uh, I started smoking when I was like 16. And then when I joined the military, I, I quit just like, all right, I'm done. And then when I, then after, when I got into the, the SEAL teams, I started smoking again. Did and you, even though you had to, even though you had to maintain all of that physical, uh, uh fitness, you were smoking. Yeah. Yeah. So you're I, like I in your smoking. early twenties at this point. Yeah. You know, like hanging out at, at a bar in Virginia beach, the young team guy smoking, drinking at a bar thinking I'm invincible. Yeah. You can well, smoke I, at I that age and not really feel as much an impact as you can when you're our age. Yeah. I mean, I quit when I was 30, like it got to the point where, I was on deployment and I was smoking a cigarette and literally like, I just took a drag. I, I lit one up. I took a drag and I was like, it just wasn't enjoyable. I was like, this tastes like shit. And I flicked it About away. The it was the last same age I quit. Yeah. It was like the last time I ever smoked a cigarette. So that's funny. Yeah. So you're out there having to run like a and then you guys had yeah. like your heart rate had come down and you ah, get one of these. You're like, oh, that's old school. Yeah. Uh, Stupid I wouldn't say it was, uh, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't say it was a smart <laughs> thing to do. Uh, or necessarily old school. It just, I just, just mean like back in the day, nobody thought anything of it. Well, you know, like nowadays, smoking's just not cool. Like it's such for some a, reason. It's such a, 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 like you go hide now. Yeah. Yeah. Like vaping's cool, I guess. I don't vaping know. Is so but stupid. I, yeah, yeah. I don't know what's cool or not, but like smoking is definitely like, it's, bit, it's got a stigma now that like, the Marlboro man has been, he's no longer six feet deep. He's like 20 feet deep. Like no one really well, remembers. People understand the, the bullshit of marketing and how the tobacco companies really, you know, I know the, the lies like, Ooh, Joe Camel was so cool. It made me want to smoke. No, <laughs> Joe Camel didn't make me want to smoke. My buddy smoked and my yeah. grandparents smoked and every adult I knew smoked. So I picked up cigarettes like, but they did push that hard. Yeah. You know, and, I thought it was cool when I was a kid. So I did it, you know, like obviously a sucker for peer pressure, but, uh, but no, back to the story, you know, like went through, went through buds and then, you know, like came to Virginia beach was my first seal team was seal team two checked in, uh, October 98 and really never looked back. Cause I don't know what I, so why did I make a career out of it? Why did I do 20 years? Just because, man, it's the best job going, man. It's so fun. It, it was fun. Yeah. You are, do you have to, every day, are you thrusting yourself headfirst into the meat grinder? Yeah, you are, right? Head, like mind, body, soul, like, 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 you know, into the grinder, you know, into the grinder you go, just like pounding it out. But at the same time, God, it is so fun. It is so fun. And you get to meet some amazing, amazing dudes, work with some like, some of the most talented men, some of the most brightest dudes I've ever worked with. And like guys from different backgrounds that you would never, ever think that would become a seal, but they, they do. And it's, I don't know, just something about it was, was awesome. And retiring was really the hardest, was the hardest decision I ever had to make in my adult life. Would you have retired if you didn't have a young family at home? You think you'd have? Uh, probably not. Like if I didn't have a young family, because you know, I mean, it's not, and it's not like that was, it was kind of a huge decision for me, uh, having, you know, the, my family and like, cause I did start my family a little bit later in life. Um, you know, some guys, you know, they're at like 20, some 22 years and their kids are going to like college, you know, yeah. like they, they started, they started their families pretty early, but you know, I just thought it was, it was kind of one of these things too, where I had to sit back and go, man, you know, like, I was on the same target with him and he got, you know, he got, there's some shit going on with him. Like him, me and him, we were in the same helicopter crash together and he's all jacked up like him. And like, so there's just correlations that I was like looking, going like, man, you can't be in this game for like, statistically speaking, when you're in this game that long, like something's just going to happen. And if it doesn't happen in training or in combat, it's just going to be, it's just going to be the grind, right? That daily grind that you're in, that something's just going to give and snap. And, uh, I thought to myself, I was like, man, well, do I want to spend my forties as like, you know, a troop chief, you know, like trying to make it through the ranks all the way up to, 
whatever, even squatter mass sheep, hopefully one day, or do I say, you know what? I had a great run. It was awesome. Uh, no regrets. Well, that's kind of bullshit. Everybody's got regrets, but like, I mean, like had a great run and, and thank you for not being a pussy and saying that because yeah, I don't regret yeah. shit. Bullshit. Of course you do. <laughs> everybody, yeah. everybody has their regrets. And if you don't yeah. have regrets, it means you just didn't learn shit. Right. Yeah. Cause you, you make you, you have regrets cause you step on your dick and you make a big mistake. And then it takes you having to like sit and, and be with that regret to actually like learn something and go. And then eventually those, I think that's, I think that's why people say it's like, I have no regrets. It's because eventually they probably learn through that mistake and then they're kind of glad they made it. So they don't yeah. have any regrets, but in, but it, it's bullshit. You know, it. so it, anyways, I think it's problematic when people dwell on it and they go, Oh, I, I, you know, that one thing ruined me. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. No, agreed. I don't want to sidetrack you. No, you totally did. Cause my, my brain. So you were like, saying oh, no, you, you yeah. thought to yourself, I could have gone on and become this like squadron master chief. Yeah. yeah. No, I could, I could have like, you know, gone and like continued to, to, to be in the, in the game, right? Like do my position, uh, uh you know, like, but it, it is kind of a game at that point where you're like, Hey, you're still doing the job and the job is awesome, but you're kind of like, you're in this leadership position and then you kind of, you go out and then you're like in this off cycle. Uh, and it could be, but you're in an off cycle. You could be training, you could be doing some other stuff in an operational capacity. You could, you know, you could decide to do something, you know, like more administrative or, and then you go back into another leadership position, right? Then it's maybe it's, uh, uh, an ops master chief and big ops. Maybe it's a, a squadron master chief. Maybe it's uh, opposite of that order. And then maybe even one day the command CMC, but it's like, you have, to, once you get to a certain level, and you're stepping out of like the tactical leader of, of, te of team leader and troop chief, you go beyond that. And it's kind of, it's, it's not as fun as, as what it, um, is what it is at the tactical level. And so like, I kind of made the decision early prior to, to doing a troop chief position, just saying like, Hey man, I'm just going to call it a good run and, and, uh, and call it a day, call it a career. Mm -hmm. Like I said, mm -hmm. it was, hard man it was hard because i still miss i still miss i still love it but there's no way i there's no way i can replicate it and there's like it's almost this thing where of course you're gonna miss it because there's nothing else like it you know i'm I'm coming down from a 20-year high like i was a freaking addict for 20 years and now i'm coming down and I, I mean i'll probably be coming down for another 15 or 20. how's your body oh it's good i was fortunate man i got 10 fingers 10 toes i got my wits about me i'm fine like, yeah, do I have little like tweaks, pings, my knees, you know, jacked up? Is my back hurt? Yes, it does. But at the same time, like I got no complaints because I know guys that, you know, aren't okay. Yeah. A friend I mean, of mine uh, got two knee surgeries and he's going in for both of his hips. I think the first hip's getting done next week and then the other one's scheduled for a few months after. Just like that's pretty, you're pretty wore out when all of your moving parts are getting replaced with plastic and titanium. <laughs> you know? it, ain't, it ain't no old man sport. That's for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, uh, the wear and tear on the family has got to be huge too. That part, you know, you probably impossible to quantify for anybody. Yeah. My wife is super supportive. She's awesome. And, uh, you know, like, so she was very supportive of me and she was even supportive of me continuing on my career. She yeah. wanted, she knew that, that uh, whatever I did, I had to be happy. Like, and if I wasn't happy doing what I was gonna, like doing, whether I was transitioning out or staying in, that it would affect me. And then what I would, and it, what affects me, affects the whole family. Same yeah. thing with her, right? So um, she was super supportive, wanted me to be happy. And, uh, but at the same time, I knew that, you know, everything kind of revolved around me, my schedule, my job, my career. Um, you know, it wasn't like I was dialing back saying, look, I need to stop being so selfish and then retire. It wasn't really about that. It was just going like, well, maybe it's time, you know, mm -hmm. maybe it's time. I'll tell you a funny story. My, one of the, one of the, I saw I was like on the fence and my daughter is amazing, right? She, <laughs> so we have a little cabin that's about three hours west of Virginia beach. And my wife needed some like much needed, uh, like Jade time. Her name's Jade. I was like, okay, go ahead go on a trip with uh, your friends, you know, like I'll take the kids and I'll, I'll, you know, don't worry about it. Just leave. 
have a good time. And uh, so I brought him to the cabin. We kind of were doing our thing and, you know, walking through the woods, doing all this stuff. And so one day we just had to go to town to grab some stuff. I think my son at the time was two and my daughter was four. And so we're sitting there and I'm just having a conversation with her. Uh, it, like she's an adult, right? Like we're driving down the road. I'm like, oh yeah, you know, cause I don't know. I mean, I guess that's just, I just felt like it. But I started talking to her about how I didn't know if I wanted to retire. And I, I think I wanted to, I had already announced to, to my command, I wanted to retire, but I was thinking about going back on my, like going I back. I can imagine a four-year-old that. sitting there staring out the window, yeah. listening to her and dad. Like, <laughs> you know, like saying all these things and like kind of getting deep with it. And then, then I started talking about, I was like, I was like, I just don't know if I can stop doing the job. And kind of like what I was talking about earlier, where it's like addictive, where like, it's like, you know, I got to, you know, like go to these places that were, you know, yeah, they sucked and they were dangerous, but they were, you know, it's like, I got to do things there that, you know, like I was really fortunate to do with some awesome guys. It really is more about just being with them and like doing mm -hmm. the job with them, like just getting out in front of the fire pit and getting radio checks before you load the helo and then jumping on a bus and bullshitting, coking and joking as you, as you drive to the, to the, to the freaking um, to the pad and then loading the bird and then taking off and landing in the middle of Indian country and then going, all right, Hey, we good. We got a full head count. Let's move out. And then getting to a place where you're like, all right, we're here. Let's go over the wall. And then you go over the wall and you do what needs to be done. And, uh, I just was like kind of telling her all this stuff. And I'm like, I just don't know if I can stop doing that. Like, I just don't know if I can give that up. And I swear to God, I swear to God, she looked at me and she said, dad, and there's a four year old girl, mind you, she goes, dad, the killing season is over. And I was like, Whoa, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say, I didn't say anything about, you know, killing bad guys or anything like that. I didn't say anything about that stuff. All I said was going over, like going over wall and doing what needs to be done. That's pretty much the exact words I said. And she looked at me and she says, dad, the killing season is over. And that was when I was like, Holy shit maybe she's right. <laughs> and, you know, but it really made me focus on my daughter at that moment, that moment in time. Like I looked at her and I was like, holy crap, like how awesome is this little human being right here? And like, am I just going to keep grinding away and, and, and continue on in the killing season? Or am I going to, uh, to try something new and try something different? Like I said, little, it has little people are intuitive, man. She probably heard yeah. you talking to mom, picked up stuff for the four years she was alive and knew what was up. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, man. It was, it was awesome. It That's was like, eerie. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. And I, I, I even wrote down that story for her when she like, she gets, you know, cause I, t I've told it to her. One day when you, one that. day when you marry her off part of your speech and you can look the dad in the eye or the, the husband to be in the eye groom and let him know like, I'm always still ready to kill my <laughs> after the story. Oh yeah. I, yeah. We'll have to I, word smith that up a little bit for the, for the <laughs> father speech, but yeah. Oh yeah. No. So really like that was, I just decided to do something else and what that was, I had no idea. And then I got involved in building these targets and yeah, shit, the rest is history. So and here I am today did, on the higher line podcast. Nice. Hell yeah. Did your, um, did your wife, what did she say when you told her that story? She was like, she had no doubt. She knows it. Like, she was like, yep, our daughter has an old soul. She's like, she's, you know, my, my wife's like, she was probably like, something was probably speaking through her, like get letting you know. And I'm like, well, probably, you know? So it was, it's definitely, uh, definitely something I won't ever forget. That's cool. You know? How old is she now? Like eight or 10? No, nah, she's nine. Okay. I was close right in between. Right. Have you between. ever talked to her about it since? I have. I have. Did she right remember it? She, she says she does, but you know, like. But you I mean, don't know if, if she's remembering because you told her the story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I just didn't know if there was something else. Like maybe she can give us like some winning lottery tickets or something. Cool. <laughs> no. no. I'm just kidding. Yeah. So now here you are. It is That's funny right. how, um, how life plays out, you know, I'm sure uh, 19 year old you, 19 year old me didn't ever think like we do the things that we did in our life. My stories are not as cool as yours, but um, 
it's like uh this is why people have no regrets if you can appreciate all the decisions that you have lead to wherever it is you are that's yeah. true although yeah. sometimes people use that no regrets thing like uh as a way to be a dick you know like just being me man no regrets like no you're an asshole like that I, I, you know what i mean yeah i it's i know what you mean but it's hard for me to to like i because I, I am kind of an asshole you're and a you know if a lot of a lot of the, if you were to talk to a lot we've of actually had know like me fights well, before. Be like, we've had like fights before you and, me and I. you yeah, we've had like oh, fights where it's like I'm like I don't even think I want to talk to that guy no, anymore. No, it's not really a fight. More, it's just a like fight. A little, it's like a fight. A little, it's a tiff. It's a fight. It's like, man, that guy's <laughs> a, that guy's really mean to me, and I don't think oh. I want to subject myself to his abuse. Yeah, you know, <laughs> that ain't funny. That's pa passion, passion, caring. Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. learning how to. My, my friend Z and I talk about this stuff all the time and he and I have had some, some arguments before, not like, you know, crazy, but like, you know, you like, you believe in something. And I think sometimes when you care about somebody and then they disagree with you or say something that challenges you, then you take it even harder than if it's, you know, just some stranger challenging. It's like, Oh, well, supposed to like agree with me. I, you're not really like it. it I mean, we're all I'm saying I like guess, on an I emotional level. Saying like on an emotional level, we think like that. Like, you know, we're supposed to be like, you know, like same team, and you don't agree with me. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. You know, but I, I really think like, you know, because I, I was, I grew up, and I mean, grew up, I grew up as an adult, like in an arena of men, like who were just who were awesome, like, you know, I had the, the my peers who were at the same level, the, the guys the coming up. You were, you're talking about you grew up not as a child. Once you went into the teams, you're saying that your maturity came yeah. from being a young man turning into an older man around uh, uh, yeah. highly evolved predators. Yeah, just learning how to be a man amongst men, you know. Yeah. Like, and then uh, and there was no, and there's not really a lot of ego in in in, in that environment to where you guys can like. I think guys are kind of inherently different too, where we can have an argument and we can be like, shut up, man. You don't know what the F you're talking about, this, that, and the other. And then uh, maybe even get pissed off and walk away. But then two seconds later, like walk up, hand you a beer, be like, what's up? So, hey, anyways, like, and, and yeah. just kind of forget about it. Like, let it, let it go to the wayside. Um, and if you're like holding on to stuff and you're not just kind of letting it go, or at least you're not airing it out. Like that's the thing too, is like you got to air it out. Cause as, you know, generally like, and I, I think if you're not airing it out, like, and calling out the way it is and just making sure that everything is complete and it's done, then, uh, then it's just kind of a bitch move and you're leaving something open, like mm -hmm. a festering wound. And if you like close it out and then make sure if there's a healing process, like there's a healing process and getting called out and somebody saying, Hey man, you that up this, that, and the other. And then you're like, yeah yeah you're right i did it, it makes you never a do it again person too <laughs> I'll never when you do can it again. openly have that <laughs> yeah. discussion yeah because everyone sees it happening right like because a lot of times i mean i mean i've things like I've a lot of stuff right mm -hmm. and uh you know and i've gotten called out in front of a lot of people and you have an opportunity there you have an opportunity to go yeah i can make an excuse or ah let me tell you what i was thinking or you can say yeah i Right. Yeah. And have I always made the right decision? No, I haven't made all the right decisions. But you know what? When you make the right decision and say, "Yeah, I, I totally did," and it was me, and there is no excuse, and it'll never happen again. Right. It, it's such um, a streamlined when, way of communicating, yeah. too. Yeah. Like if I you like if like if, if you were doing that to me, and I spend twenty minutes with this circle jerk of excuses. And then eventually I either like leave and like hold my line of I'm right him or I finally admit to it. We wasted 20, 30 minutes could have been over with it and just moved on to the next thing. Yeah. And it's a healing process for everyone too, because everyone sees you go through that and everyone sees you make the right decision. And then they go, you know what? Hey, you did that up. He really big, but you know what? He owned up to it and uh, yeah, whatever. It's over. Yeah. And then, it's over for everyone. It's over for you. It's over for the guys that are around you that count on you. It's over for the guys that, that like are looking at you, judging you. It's, it's over. And as long as it's not a pattern, Hey, 
you're, you know, it's like a nice healing process. I've noticed in my adult life, probably started in my 20s, if I saw somebody take that road of the excuse, I put them in a box in my head, like, that'll never be my real friend, that person. Like, if I saw them do that, just because it was like, I don't want to be around somebody that's like that. I don't want to be around the dude that makes excuses instead of wanting to be better. Like, I instantly, I never, I never did it consciously until I was in my mid thirties, but I look back, I would just compartmentalize them into that's a, and that and did you ever go up to that person later and go like, Hey man, well, why did you say that? Why did you say that? Why didn't you say what you just, uh, why didn't you just say that you not often because at the time I think I just thought I don't want to waste my time with somebody that doesn't care enough to be honest with themselves. I more than anybody I know. And I think that's why I was so um, hard on people. Cause like, if, like as much as I, if you drew, sorry, cause I know you're having to do a lot of beep beeps here. The, um, I thought you said we could cuss on this show. We can, we can, but on YouTube, he edits out or he oh, leaves the thing yeah, because yeah. otherwise YouTube um, like makes the content like, you know, NC 17 triple X bullshit. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it PG 13. How about that? I mean, I, the problem that I have when I do that, it makes my, it changes my cadence of thought when I have to stop myself from speaking as God created me. Yeah. My wife says I need to stop saying the word so much anyway. So Sharon was laughing at me yesterday. I was, uh, <laughs> we got a new TV and, um, I don't remember what I'm putting it together. Not a big deal, but I'm like, I must have said about 38 cuss words. I wasn't angry. I was talking to myself as I was digging for something in the toolbox and like just manipulating the TV and plugging things together. And I think I said about, you know, 20 times. And she's like, you should hear yourself. You sound like an idiot. And I was like, shut up. (laughs) (laughs) Shut up. Anyway, anyway, did I ever go back? No, I think, I I mean, the way I look at it is if I have to ask you that, you don't get it. And maybe if, you know, there's uh, things, go ahead. I'm just saying like, what if they don't get it? And what well, if that, you know, and what if you're able to go, Hey man, uh, here's the deal. Like people are looking at you up because so, so I, only, yes. I only know this because there was a time in my military career where I was riding so high on the horse. I thought my shit didn't stink. And it took a guy that, that when people were looking at me like, yeah, this yeah, he just doesn't. Oh, like, you shut your camera off or something. Oh, uh oh, hold on a second. Let me uh, decline. Oh, you got a call coming in. Yeah, sorry, I had a call coming in. No, so I only know this because, like, when I was in the the military, I was like, there I had a, there was a time in while I was in the military, I was like really riding high on horse, and I thought talk I about that for a minute before you finish the story. Like, what? Um, you're just physically fit. You're you're nailing all of your your different claws. Yeah. Your your shit don't stink. Your yeah, I just thought that I was a lot better than I really actually was. Right. Okay. And that was, uh, was affecting the decisions I was making. It was affecting like how I was being, it was affecting my character. Right. And, uh, was it took a guy 11. No, no. Okay. No. Uh, and it took a guy who was in a, uh, a leadership role who, when most of the people, most of the people were just kind of looking at me like, yeah, whatever, you know, kind of like, yeah, he's just either they wrote me off or they were just kind of like, yeah, it's just him, right? Uh, I took one of the uh, a guy in a leadership position to call my shit out, and all like not just call my stuff out, but like really come down hard on me when I made because I had made a mistake, and I was kind of like ah, you know, not a bit. I was like making, I was making excuses because I had enablers, I had enablers that were telling me like, oh, don't worry, it wasn't your fault. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, that shit. Like oh yeah, don't worry, it's not a big deal. But, uh, you know, it took that guy basically coming down so hard on me that I almost like shit, like jeopardized my position in the squadron. Um, it it was, I thought like, so I guess coming back to the moral of the story, right? The moral of the story is be the guy that makes somebody uncomfortable and fricking pops them down to another level and be like, Hey man, I don't know if you get, you might take this the right way might take it the wrong way you might not even think about it until about a year from now and then maybe you'll think i'm right <laughs> but here it is and then just let them know and be like hey, i think that's is, excellent you know, advice that you know I, 
my, my pushback on that was it's there's there's got to be a relationship for that. Like, I don't go to the the guy at the, that's my waiter and be like, you know, guy, I got to tell you something. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know you. You, you got to have a relationship. Yeah. That that commanding officer or senior person that did that to you had a relationship with you that he could do that. Like, you yeah. got to, yeah. That was my only point. Like, sometimes it's just, if, if you don't have that rapport, all you're going to get is pushback, some kind of rapport or, or um, seniority in some way over the person. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, it's true. Very true. I think that's excellent. So, so basically you're saying be responsible for helping the people around you mature, if able. Yeah, you know, because if it's, especially if it's like, like you said, if, if you have a relationship with that person and you're able to like, it's going to be uncomfortable for everybody, but if you're able to get in that uncomfortable zone and, and help that person out, then, uh, and that's saying sometimes it involves you telling a really like, like shitty story about yourself, like how you really like screwed something up monumentally. And it took you like having to come and like learn these things and learn like, Hey, you're the source of all your problems. And if you're continually saying, Hey, uh, yeah, it was because of this, or I was thinking this, like nobody cares yeah. what you were thinking. Like nobody cares what you were thinking. It's thoughts, words, deeds. It's what you did. Right. Mm -hmm. And own what you did. Right. No one cares about the origination of this deed. They just care about the deed, yeah. you know? So I agree. Uh, That's yeah. what you're talking about is kind of the premise of all the training that we do. While I teach people to shoot guns, uh, everybody that comes to our course gets a, a PDF sent to them weeks before the course to read. And it's all about thoughts, words, deeds. And it's uh, who gives a f much of a badass you are if you're a piece of shit and can't be self-aware or how much guns you own or how much you can shoot or how much money you can amass. If you can't be honest with yourself, who cares? You're never yeah. gonna sleep. You're never gonna sleep good. Isn't that that's some of the stuff you do at like S12 though, isn't he? Like, do you Very do some of that so. stuff at S12? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, to me that has to be t t completely coupled with our training. For me, other yeah. people not so much. You know, like, no, I can just go learn this mechanical thing. There's a group of guys I used to train with that I don't because it was never a happy vibe. Not that training has to be happy, but it was like everybody was in competition mentally and physically against each other not in a healthy way it yeah. was like you know like you know like i'm gonna loosen up his lug nuts kind of shit and drain the oil out of his airplane engine like uh was that uh, uh what movie was that yeah. that was uh, iron eagle where he screwed up the engine oil when they went to go fly the snake remember that damn lewis gossett jr yeah, he took his little Cessna and raced that badass kid on the Enduro through the snake. <laughs> you could have yeah. killed him, man. Yeah, he let, drained some of his engine oil out of his airplane, and it doesn't matter. But, like, you know, that kind of unhealthy uh, – <laughs> you got to train and be around people that want you to be better, and in turn you want to want them to be better. Yeah, no, agreed, hundred percent. Like that's one of the, I try to I try to simplify things for my kids and give them like three rules. I'm like, there's only three rules you need to do, and that's it. But and the third rule is empower yourself and others. Like if you Let's hear if the you're three not rules. oh the three rules are number one listen and focus right number two do as you're told and do it right the first time and number three empower yourself and others and I'm like hey just do those three things if you do those three things you won't so, hear shit from me. Your younger one is how old? Like he, five? He's seven. Seven. Um, yeah. Those are some pretty heady concepts. Empower yourself and others. I remember as a young man, like listening to my dad say, like, buckle down. What the f does that mean? You know, <laughs> like empower yourself and others. Does, does a seven-year-old, and I like it because I don't, I think kids need to be pushed. I pushed mine hard. Um, do they ever say like, dad, I don't know what empower myself and others looks like or means? Well, I kind of had a, 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 a suspicion that they didn't when I was like, cause I, I didn't know how, like, how else do you say empower to like, you know, have, so a kid understands it. So I'm like, just empower, like empowerment, you know? And then I kind of explained what it meant. I was like, you know, when you empower somebody, like you don't like cut somebody down and tell them what they did wrong all the time. You're kind of like trying to like build them up, right? You're going to build them up and make them feel good. 
make them feel like they can accomplish something and make them feel like they can take on the world. Like that's empowerment, not going, yeah, you up. or like, Hey, you're, Oh, I don't like that guy because he does all this stuff wrong. Or I'm going to talk about what he does wrong so much that he can't stop thinking about it when I'm around. Like, that's not empowering. Like, I, I guess I try to keep teach my kids a little bit of like examples and stuff like her yeah. examples and metaphors. Cause it's hard. I find it hard. Like, They'll, they'll come on, they'll test me like, Hey dad, what does this word mean? And sometimes they'll give me a word. I'm like, uh, <laughs> it is something that, yeah, exactly. Like, and then, so I'll just make a metaphor, you know, but then, no, my kids, so to answer it, no, they know, they know what the empowerment means. And they know, especially too, like you can't empower others if you're not empowering yourself, right? So yeah. Like empower yourself first and then empower others. Self-love, man. Can't you gotta love have yourself, it. you can't love anybody. You gotta have number it. one was listen and focus listen and focus number yeah. two was do it right the first time do as you're told oh, and do, do it right you're... the do as you're told and do it right the first time right and then empower yourself and others and the reason that it's like do as you're told do it right the first time like because hey unless they're i don't know even unless they're the president of the United States, they're probably going to be taking direction from someone. And even then you're as the president of the United States, you're going to be taking cues and directions from somebody as well. So, you know, like the president it's more still is like, subject to our constitution. Like every and all citizen is in no way above the law. Very true. And he very has afforded true. no rights that we are not. Very true. True words have never been spoken. So uh, yeah, so, these rules, yeah. Uh, did you, did these come from somewhere? Did you uh, like, as a young father sit there and think, man, I got to have something cool to pass on to these kids. Uh, no. Okay. No, it was just kind of like one of these things where I was like, you know what? I gotta like figure I got to simplify some stuff, you know? Cause like the, you know, Mervin, he went to, so the kids preschool, they had like the, uh, you know, the old rules of the roost and, and they, you know, they would like be kind to others and stuff like that, which is good, which is good. I don't want to water down those things, but they had like five rules. And then the school they go to has like seven rules. I'm like, man, you know, I like to keep the old rule of threes, but how do you try to like cram everything into rules and like three rules? And so that's the best I could come up with. My buddy, super Dave, I've said this out of, 20 out of 100 podcasts, I bet, but it's, it's similar. He says, everything's important. Everything matters. Do the right thing at the right time every time. Not the same, but it's like, like the first time I heard him say that, I was like, Shut but then I've thought about it over the years. Like, everything's important. Everything matters. Do the right thing at the right time every time. You can apply that to like pretty much like any scenario. And yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, really to me, that speaks volumes is just like paying attention and being present in the yeah. moment and the details are everything. And you'll never get the details unless you're present in the moment. So it's like, everything's important. Like, so if you're not paying attention and you're not present in the moment, you're not going to see like the importance of that one thing that you would have just sloughed off. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I'm guilty no, of I'd that sometimes that. listening to, uh, could be on the firing line with you running a class and you're like, Oh, here's what you're going to do. You know, you start, you know, barking out orders. Be like, wait, what did he just say? I'm staring right at you, but my brain went elsewhere. And that's something as simple as that, or the kids telling you something, Hey, how was work today? And you ask the question and then the kid starts telling you, Oh, you know, my coworker, my daughter's got a job. And I ask her about work. I ask. And then sometimes like the words just trickle right by and I have to like snap myself. Pay attention, mother. You know, I say that to myself. Pay attention. <laughs> it's easy to. Maybe I'm sorry. My, I can blame I'm sorry. I wasn't listening. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <I'm sorry>. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. It happens. It's easy to it, do. It, it's it is kind of easy to do because you know, like everyone needs their moments to check out, right? Because being present all the time is mentally exhausting, yeah. and you know, sometimes you just check out, but unfortunately we all do it. I mean, I do it sometimes. I, I can't say we all do it. It's a very generalizing statement, but, uh, I do it when I, uh, you know, sometimes I'll just check out at the wrong time. My what wife you, will get, get on me off for that. What do you do and to right check so. yourself back in? Do you have anything? Is there like, a, you have another three step mantra, Corey, pay <laughs> attention. Number one, number two. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't. And I'm, I'm not making fun. Like, I, I wrote your rules down. I'm going to. Oh, man. I feel. Uh, I feel. Read them later. Whoa. 
Yeah. Well, my, hey, Journey and Mervin have them memorized, so they're I not hard to memorize. Not. Number one, listen and focus. Number two, do as you're told. Do it right the first time. Number three, uh, 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 shit. Uh, give me, give me the first word. Empower. Yeah, empower yourself and others. Boom. Yeah. Got it. Even though they were written in front of me, I didn't want to cheat. Well, hey, you know, that's called integrity. Nobody, not everybody's got it. I will have them memorized. Uh, no, uh, what, shit. What were you asking me? Talk about lack of presence. Talking about right? what do you do to knock yourself what, oh, back oh. into it? What do I do? Sometimes I just take, uh, like I just stop and I just take a big deep breath and then I just kind of like recenter myself. Like, okay, I need it. Like, it's like a hard, like, like a reboot, you know, like you're like letting your compass needle come back to zero as it's bouncing yeah. around. Yeah. You know, and you know what? I, so my, my wife is doing a lot of yoga lately. She's doing a lot of yoga. And so I'm doing, helping her with yoga by doing I've yoga. I've done yoga her. for years. Don't, and you, didn't, and you don't need to feel weird about it. No, I don't feel weird about it at all. Cause it actually, it helps out a lot. Like for me, like being present, you know, like, cause a lot of the, you know, and a lot of the times too, like if you're doing like a guided yoga, they're telling you like, Hey, be present in the moment, like feel what your body is feeling. And so yeah. You know, a lot of that just has to do with breath and, uh, you know, just kind of, it's hard. Like, so how do you, that's a good question. Like, how do you measure presentness? Cause it's not even a word, right? It's not presentness. How do you, how do you measure that? Sometimes how can you it's, quantify it, that? I've, I wrote about this once in like, uh, I never published it anywhere. I wrote it once as I was sitting, trying to be present, writing about being present, being cognizant of my ability to be present. Of course, I'm not present. I'm somewhere else in my other part of my brain that's writing and being analytical. And like, it's, I just was on a little short vacation with my wife and it's very few and far between moments that I feel completely relaxed. And it's, it's not for any reason or not that I think I just have so many different things in the brain and no phone, no music, uh, no TV, no stimuli other than like whatever nature or our environment has. It could be like one time we were somewhere and I remember these moments with total clarity. Like we were in a coffee shop. It was our anniversary a couple of years ago. We went to a coffee shop uh, prior to a friend's wedding that was on our anniversary and we're having coffee. I got my arm around Sharon and we're listening to all the people in this like quaint little farm town. And I just remember being like, not not tactical minded, but just visually aware of all the shit happening, plates clanking, people's voices, the smell of foods. And I was just like, you know, smelling my coffee as I was sipping it. It was just like, you know what I mean? Like a calm yeah. cool pool of water that Zen talks about. And yeah. And then like that, it can all go away. You know, phone vibrates in the pocket or uh, you know, something happens that shifts your mental focus. It's like, how do I get there? It's the removal of self. Yeah. Right. So yeah. like you had you, at that moment, there was not, there was no, you, it was mm -hmm. only the moment. Right. Uh -huh. And it, you know, the very, it's very Zen, you know, like, okay, we're, but it's the same thing. It's like, it's, I, so I'm a firm believer in that when it comes to like weapons instruction and or, and, or anything like physically like or skills based right skills based you got to immerse like if you're not immersing yourself in the action so like when you were in that coffee shop you were immersed in the moment you weren't thinking about yourself you were thinking you weren't even really thinking you were just you were absorbing the moment like mm -hmm. plates clanking you can see you're, you're basically just kind of taking in the whole the whole thing and if you're if you're trying to learn a skill right it's hard not to think but you've got to immerse yourself in the, in the action and remove the self. Like there is no actor, only the action, right? Like mm. the very Zen thing. Like, it's but, true though. Uh, but it's like you, you, if you are focused on you performing the action, you're going to be thinking about yourself and not messing it up or doing good or whatever. You're there. Like, but if you're just thinking about the action and thinking about performing the action, then it's just going to happen through you. And it's not, even like you're not even really part of the equation anymore. Um, it's, uh, it's not, it's not easy to do all the time, but when you're struggling to get over like a hump, 
Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's like the number one thing you should do is try to try to remove like yourself, or, like remove your, the removal of self from that, from that thing, especially like if it's skills based, immerse yeah. yourself in the action. That's, that's, that's the Zen thing. To- yeah. That you're talking about. I'm the moon beneath the waves. I'm and I shouldn't I'm say that all. I never relax, <laughs> but at that that level of of um, complete calmness is few and far between, just because the world we live in. That documentary I was watching, I forwarded it to a few buddies of mine that are that are at high levels of of various games in life, and there was because there was a bunch of really good discussions in there from uh, uh, performance psychologists, and one of the things that we all know, but it's just nice to hear it in different takes on it. They're interviewing these guys. What are you thinking about when the flag's about to drop at the start of the race? Nothing. You know, I'm thinking about nothing. And people are like, you can't be thinking about nothing. Like you're thinking about the clutch. And he's like, no, I'm not. I'm not thinking about that at all. My deep side of me knows how to do all that. I'm literally like thinking about nothing or a baseball player or, you know, a soldier. just things go to that space that that place people fight and pay to somebody to teach them how to get there to to let their subconscious really go the zone right yeah because it when like you're immersed in the action when you're learning it you're immersed in the action and the action only but when the action becomes subconscious Mm -hmm. like that race car driver you're talking about he's like you were in the coffee shop he's just immersed in the moment Mm -hmm. because all he has to do is just do what is subconscious to him because he's not really learning anymore. He's just performing it. He's just, he's just doing, mm-hmm. and there's just no him. It's just, it's just doing it. Right. It's just letting go of, of himself and everything else. And just being in that car and smelling the freaking fumes and feeling mm-hmm. the, the steering wheel and, you know, just being one with what's going on and just going, all right, I'm going to make it happen. You know, so I and, listen to, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say, I, well, I was struggling uh, one time. I went to Mid South, and I was struggling to get on the board that they had for the uh, for Pistol Mania, and I had shot and barely and barely not got on the board. Right, like I had not got on it, and only by a few seconds. And uh, my my shooting sensei, he's like the guy who taught me how to shoot uh, as a team guy. He basically told me, he's like, all that board is is fundamentals done right. Mm-hmm. That's it. He's like, it's not thinking about the time. It's not, you know, all it is is just your fundamentals done right. And, and it's just, that's just the performance of the action. That's it. That's it. So there really is no actor, just the action. Just perform the fundamentals as, they're, as they need to be performed and you will attain the goals. You will succeed. And when he told me that, it made, it made total sense. Um, but we all have those little moments where somebody drops these nuggets of knowledge on you and you just pray to god that at that moment you're like a sponge sucking it in you know that's why you gotta listen and focus (sighs) yeah Uh uh-huh that's why you gotta listen and and focus do as you're told and do it right the first time so he told me he told me those are fundamentals done right so i just go do it and do it right the first time that's super true with (laughs) anything a guy racing a car is still moving a steering wheel working the pedals they're just linking all of those things together to make the car not crash into the trees or drop the magazine or miss the target or whatever. Yep. Frank Proctor, SF vet, uh, grandmaster, USPSA shooter, uh, renowned instructor. He says, let it do. He's a Southern boy from Alabama. and hit, like, let it do. He's saying, let your subconscious do what you trained it to do. Just let it, let it go. Like, but as we know, you have to first program correctly because you can put a really shitty program into that brain. But I mean, I know what he's saying. He's just saying like, just be in the, be in the action. Like let the action take place. Let it do like, you you know, like it's, there's no I or you in that. It's like, let it do not yeah. you not let you do it let it do I, it's, I, a fun I see what you're experiment. it's a fun experiment learning to go to that place i've uh, i've done things where i've pushed myself uh being fearful or anxiety ridden and you have that like nagging you know 
dragging at your brain as you're trying to fight through something. And then other times, maybe a similar task, you are able to cut that off and just let it do and let your subconscious just go. And you can almost feel it. Maybe you get comfortable as you're progressing through whatever it is, be it like public speaking or shooting a match or something. And you, you can almost look back in the mind's eye and like feel the moment or see the moment that you felt you, you, you let go, you know, you know what I mean? That's, I'm sorry. I wasn't listening. I wasn't in the moment. <laughs> Just kidding. That's the, that's the third I'm joking. That used I'm, that joke. I know. And it's yeah. pretty pathetic, but it's the story of my life. <laughs> I, I think that this was a really good conversation. I often wrap this discussion up with a, a question like this. So the thousands of people that download and listen to and view this podcast, we appreciate them. And I like to bring people on like you that have awesome life experiences that they can pass on some knowledge. And I like to say, uh, if these folks never met you in person, if this was the only interaction they ever had with Corey, what would you leave them with? It's pretty heavy. I mean, it that be, is. It could be whatever. So side note, you, um, know Master, you know who Master Ken is? Yeah. Master I got Ken. it. I got oh, it. Go ahead. Okay. I got it. Be a pro. Be a pro. Just w- whatever you do, be a pro at it. Don't like, don't do anything that like, don't do it half ass or whatever. If you're going to decide to do something, do it and be a pro. Like, so like, can I apply that to washing the dishes? Yeah, you can. Can I apply it to carving a pumpkin? Why not? taking a short walk with my dog. Well, yeah, I guess you can. There's yeah, professional just, dog just, walkers I, out there, right? Yeah. I'm just, I'm just picking so picking at you, but you're, you're right. I, I, anything worth doing is worth doing right and well. Yeah, no. And, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I got that. Cause my what wa- my wife and I were, were by the pool one time and she was busting my chops about something. And then she just threw me on the spot. She goes, what's your personal mantra right now? Like, go, you have to sit like, like you got 10 seconds, name it. And I just was like, Oh, oh, that's pretty deep. Like you laid a big, pretty deep question on me. And so did, so did she. And, uh, when she did, I was like, uh, I'll be a pro. That's it. Like, if you're going to do something, be a pro at it. Like, don't go into something half-heartedly or half-assed be a pro. You know what my takeaway is from that? If, you are a pro. A pro usually isn't a pro at a lot of shit. A pro doesn't go try 50 different things. I mean, they might have different attributes or things that they enjoy. I might be a baseball player, but I enjoy cooking. But that dude's a baseball player. And like, not to try to make it cute, but I think that's a problem. Like, yeah, I'm going to be pro at everything. But in reality, if you're really going to be a pro, you have to really focus your efforts into a thing or a few things. Not, I want to be a writer. I want to be, you know, like Jack Carr. I want to be good at everything. Screw you, Jack. I love you. He's one of those. <laughs> he's such a nice, dude, he's yeah. such a nice guy. You can't like not like <laughs> I know. He's like I know. Such but I mean, most people dude. though can't, <laughs> most people don't, we hear about people that, that, do do all of these amazing things burning it at both ends burning like this bright star but most humans to get really good or to be professional don't spread themselves too thin that i guess was the point I was making. yeah no i get it i get it and i guess another thing about being a pro is maybe it's not like picking one thing and then just like like you're talking maybe it's just exhibiting traits of professionalism you know, yeah. like just, if you're going to be a pro, like, Hey, like you say, if you're going to, if you're going to take your dog for a walk, right? Like, Hey, take your dog for a walk. If it takes a dump where some on somebody's like these, oh, when you're out, <laughs> you, know <what? laughs> uh, you know what, I'll tell you, I was wondering when that was going to happen it or if it was going to happen during this and I should have known. I should have known. I should have known. Uh, Tony. <laughs> I appreciate your time. Again, people can find you at zftechnical.com. That's correct. correct. On Instagram at zftechnical.com. You yes, can sir. also, if you guys are watching this on YouTube, just go to our uh, main channel page and just punch in 
ZF Technical. You could also Google search ZF Technical Carry Trainer, and you can see these targets in the video that we put up. And if you enjoyed this podcast, share it with your friends. Corey spent a lifetime learning the lessons that he passed on. And I think it's good that we pass that on to others because we can, because the internet's cool and allows us to do it super easy. I appreciate your time, man. No, this was fun, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. For sure. You folks listening, uh, love you. Don't be dickheads. Hope to hear from you soon. If there's somebody that you'd like on this podcast, send us a message, send them a message. Maybe you know them and say, Hey, we think that you'd be a good fit like Corey was and maybe we'll get them on. Be good. Visit our website, carrytrainer.com for information about classes held throughout the U S carry trainer apparel and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at carrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement training at carrytrainer.com or carrytrainer.com.